This is the Watchman Podcast on TV Podcast Industries. Welcome back, fellow watchers. This is episode three of the Watchmen podcast on TV Podcast Industries, and we are looking at the Watchmen TV series. And this is She Was Killed by Space Junk. Episode three, yeah. Yeah, episode three. I am one of your hosts, John. I'm one of the other hosts, Derek. And rounding out this troop of watchers, I am Chris. Yes, welcome to our spoiler-filled review on TV Podcast Industries. Remember, you can pop over to our website at tvpodcastindustries.com where you can join any good or evil podcast catcher. Please subscribe, rate us, leave a review, and share the podcast to friends, family, and everyone in between. And of course, if you have been following on with our uh, episodes we have been doing our feedback episodes as well. So remember, please check them out uh, over uh, on our feed for the Watchmen series as well. Uh, if you want to send feedback in, please send in f- feedback to our email address at feedback at tvpodcastindustries.com. You can leave a voicemail over on our website. Just go to the right-hand side tab and leave up to 90 seconds of your thoughts. And of course, we are over on Facebook you can join our Facebook group over on facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash TV podcast industries. Yes. And of course, we have our Watchmen pub quiz going on as well. So I hope you're drinking a few pints, maybe a, a glass of wine or even a, a quick shot whilst you answer these pub quiz questions on everything to do with this Watchmen series. There will be eight questions in total for each episode. Send in your answers to feedback at tvpodcastindustries.com and there will be a Watchmen-related prize to give away um, and that will be uh, called out. The winner of the pub quiz will be called out at the end of our final feedback episode. Yes, that's why there's eight questions, one per episode of the feedback. Yes. So only eight questions, not eight eight questions per episode, <laughs> just one uh, per episode. John asked the first one. Can I say slightly messed up the first one? Because the first question about episode one Ew, is about episode one and say two. That. <laughs> it was a great question. Yes, Although sir. there are actually, hint everyone, there are three answers to it. Yes, yes, there are. Um, just go and listen to the feedback episodes. We have got the question at the end of the episodes. We have also got it on our website as well. If you go to tvpodcastindustry.com, you will see it on there. Uh, and just email your answers to feedback at tvpodcastindustry.com. Chris is going to go and find the prize for you by the end of the season. All right, Chris? Sure. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> I swear I'm not just hearing about this for the first time now. <laughs> <laughs> you should have listened to the feedback episode, Chris. <laughs> I should have. Well, I will, I will say the next question I'm going to give a hint is probably who is your favorite TV podcast industry's host. And no. there's only one correct answer there. <laughs> I'm just saying. Oh, thanks, Chris. That's really nice of you. Yeah, no. <laughs> and one other thing we have to mention before we get into this episode, we have mentioned it before, but just good to reiterate when we get to this portion of our podcast. We are recording these in advance of them coming out and we're recording them because we've been lucky enough to get advanced copies of these episodes. What that does mean is sometimes in the episodes, the credits aren't correct and some of the special effects haven't been finalized for the episodes. If you watch this episode and are listening to our podcast, we are recording about a week before the episode comes out. So there's one specific uh, special effect that's in this episode that we think changes for you watching it. So when we make our comment on it, we'll talk about what special effect it is. Okay. And if it's different, you tell us in feedback. You tell us if it's different on your TVs, because I suspect it will be. It was a little bit, uh, let's say low res would be probably the way I'd say it, right? Yeah, I, I thought it was a nativity scene, actually. <laughs> I, I thought I was one of the three wise men following a star. I was just going to go unrendered, but sure, that's another way of saying it. Yeah, yeah, excellent. Well, we will find out. Uh, we will watch the episode before we do our feedback. Uh, we'll watch the final version of the episode before we do our feedback episode, and we'll comment on there. If you want to send any feedback into us, follow along exactly as John told you to. Yes, please do. Let's get into this episode. Derek, what are some of the episode details? Once again, Damon Lindelof, writer on this episode, uh, was written with uh, Leela Bayok as well. Uh, Leela has won the Writers Guild of America for her work on Castle Rock. You know, that Stephen King sort of show, the one that has all the characters from Stephen King and is set in the town that is 
in all the Stephen King books yeah, yeah. as well. So she won, uh, won for her work stuff. on that uh, from the WGA. A uh, second season of that just came out last week as well, interestingly. And she also directed the fifth episode of season three of The Leftovers. It's an excellent episode. It's called It's a Mat, 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 Mat World. Uh, and I had to write down the number of mats. <laughs> really good episode. One of the best things that I've seen this year is The Leftovers because I hadn't seen it for ages and then sat down and watched it over the course of about three weeks. I watched all three seasons of it. Um, yeah, there is good things about not, not working occasionally. <laughs> and that was definitely one of them. <laughs> well, for some. <laughs> well, that was the only good thing about not working was getting to see all of The Leftovers. Uh, so, oh well. <laughs> mm, I'm still hungry. <laughs> <laughs> but who did direct this one? Well, the director of this episode was Stephen Williams. He's directed so much great TV over the years. Just to grab a couple of little bits of things that he's directed that you might be interested in. He did uh, episode eight of season one of Westworld. Uh, Westworld season one was absolutely phenomenal. I think everybody kind of agrees about that. I think season two, slightly different and slightly more maligned. Season three, they've, they're saying they're going back to the template that they started in season one, but uh, excellent. As it got to the end of that season, everything was just wrapping up to awesome moments. Uh, he also directed one of my favorite episodes of Walking Dead. Uh, it was where we had Morgan talking about um, how he got back on the right path after going through his whole clear time um, where he met the, meets the cheesemaker and he locks him up in a, in a, a prison cell. An excellent episode. I absolutely loved uh, yeah. that one of, of Walking Dead. Uh, sometimes I forget to tell you what happens in the episodes that these people direct so you have no frame of reference as to why they're so good basically as directors and why I call them out. One other thing is We've talked about Stephen Williams before, John. He directed episode six of season one of Agent Carter, a series that we talked about yes, ooh, we almost did. five years ago. Yeah, a yeah. long time ago. Yeah. Yes. After the um, one shot, uh, Agent Carter kind of little vignette came mm-hmm. out and propelled uh, Agent Carter into two seasons of her own show, which were really, uh, I, I liked them. They're I thought good. they were really good. Yeah, really, um, really good. It was a really, really good episode. And of course, there is a Damon Lindelof connection, as there is with most people that are involved in the show. He does tend to work with people that like him. So <laughs> he did. So Stephen Williams has directed 26 episodes of Lost, a massive amount since the season of Lost is about 22 episodes. He did, directed more than a season of Lost on his own, which is pretty massive, right? That is pretty incredible. <laughs> John, do you want to tell us what the official episode description for this episode is? Sure. Following a late night visit from the senator, FBI agent Laurie Blake heads to Tulsa to take over the recent murder investigation. The Lord of the Manor receives a harshly worded letter and responds accordingly. <laughs> oh, they don't give much away, do they? They really don't. I love the Lord of the Manor, though. That's, uh, that's hilarious. We will be talking about all of those points later on. I think. Yes, I, I think the Lord of the Manor may have been revealed in this episode but we will knows? discuss this yes <laughs> yes let's get into this episode because hark i hear the doomsday clock the doomsday clock has been set to five minutes to midnight it's very weird hearing your own voice back it is a little, yes <laughs> certainly with a certain accent to it well your received british accent not your real british accent yes well absolutely i'll have to discuss it like that for the lord of the manor bit <laughs> excellent, excellent. Hark, I do hear the, the, the doves are calling. Yes. Hark, what was that? Oh, it was the apocalypse. <laughs> Does your mother know she's wearing your grapes? See? <laughs> <laughs> so, Chris, what is your five minutes to midnight point? So, I, I didn't want to do a, a John on it. I didn't want to take one point that actually was actually a full episode point. <laughs> uh, um, cheeky. <laughs> yes, I know. Thank you. I thought uh, we always no, referred to those, give... those as Chris points, though. <laughs> yes, it's just... <laughs> Okay, I didn't want to do a TV podcast interview point where we take one point that was a full yeah. episode. No, I just wanted to give a quick backstory on uh, Laurie hmm. Blake. Um, because for some of those who are watching this show and listening along may not know the history of Laurie Blake uh-huh. and how it pretends to the show and why the reveal alone was so spectacular Mm -hmm. um so just very quickly um you may know who laurie blake is and just not fully understand who she is as a character uh laurie blake is the second silk specter um previously especially in the film and the comic books she was originally known as laurie uspechik um so actually laurel jane uspechik um, and she was the daughter of Sally Jupiter, the very first Silk mm-hmm. Spectre. And her originally her father, who we thought was, um, the actual Hood of Justice. Um, but actually in actual fact, her dad was Eddie Blake, the comedian who dies at the very beginning 
of the 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 film and yeah, comic he's the murder that kicks the whole story off, really. Um, and exactly. there's some wonderful moments in that comic. I know we're going to talk about the comic hopefully when the series ends, but there's some wonderful moments in there where she avoids going to the funeral of this man, and then at the end of the book she realizes this is her father, basically. So uh, yeah. it's really interesting how they set that up throughout the book, that she doesn't like this guy, she ignores this guy, and, en- and it ends off that, wow, this was the person that should have been much more influential over her life. And we do see in the show here she has really accepted that, hasn't she, Chris? yeah. She really has. She, she's taken on the character of uh, the comedianess, if you will, or the comedian, <laughs> or just comedian, <laughs> or just comedian. Um, it's so it, at the end of the comic books, she was she hadn't taken on the name Blake. Mm-hmm. So what we're seeing here, is, and why it's so significant, is she has taken this on. Yeah, she's taken on the the persona and the history and identity of her biological father, mm-hmm. and it's only slowly revealed. So we're introduced to this character. And then we get a scene where there's the Andy Warhol painting in her house. Yeah. And you have Dr. Manhattan, you have Rorschach, you have Night Owl. And then where Silk Spectre is, you have her head. And then it pans to being her face as a y- younger. It's perfect, isn't it? So it's well done. fantastic. Mm-hmm. And that's what took me a few minutes. Like, you know the name Blake and you're like, mm, no, they, they, how, how does this all tie off? And it's only then slowly each piece of information that's given, you are given an understanding of who she was. And I have to credit the writing staff in this because they don't do a exposition dump. Mm-hmm. Um, it's like, oh, here's what she did between 1980 and now. Yeah. Um, no, they're, they're piecemealing this. So, for example, in the briefing, her lieutenant or her governor or her chief basically says to her uh, about running around in masks Mm -hmm. and specifically points to her. Yeah. Isn't that right, Agent Blake? And she's like, yes, it is. I get it. Yeah. Stop. Uh, Stop doing this. You've been obviously doing this for 20 years, (laughs) you know. Uh, Really good. My God, though, this actress, Jean Smart, who plays uh, Laurie in the episode, is fantastic she yes. is a total revelation i think i texted chris almost immediately after watching the episode going out of a billion and a billion and one what would you race this actress and why would you race the character of laurie how cool is she in this episode excellent like we we talked about regina king in episode one and how many great one-liners she had i think they upped the quotient here for laurie blake and <laughs> there's so many more great one-liners in here for Gene smart really absolutely cool i mean i love the way she embodies the comedian, mm-hmm. you know, it, it's irreverent and it, it's certainly snappy, uh, sarcastic and, and witty. Mm-hmm. Uh, I really, I really love this portrayal here. It really is kind of like she has settled into, uh, the, the knowledge that, um, the comedian was her father yeah. and, uh, obviously shown just by t- uh, taking his name. So his surname. So I, yeah. I, I think that's really, really good. I, I think as well, it, it's just, the, you know, the, the former vigilante Silk Spectre now heading up, uh, part of the FBI task force on hunting down vigilante, yeah, yeah. um, vigilantes even is really good. And to see that really clever, uh, sort of switcheroo in the bank heist as well, uh, was just a really, uh, nice moment mm-hmm. where, um, they, they're going after the shadow. And yeah, it's just really smartly done. Um, and I, I really, really enjoyed, uh, her throughout the whole of this episode. Yeah, definitely. I'm gonna, I'm gonna slide in here, Chris, uh, if, as well. Um, because my first big point of the episode is also about, about Larry as well. It's about the joke phone call to Mars, effectively, because this is how she's introduced. She's introduced making a joke, effectively. The opening of the episode has those cool new credits. Last week we had the typewriter. This week we have her making the phone call with about nine million numbers that she's dialing to, to make the call to, to Mars. You know, I guess it's like four or five area codes before she gets into the local district code, right? So yeah, the old so. touchpad noise. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, she really makes nice. the touchpad noise. It, it prints up the watchman on the screen and she starts out with, I haven't talked to you in a while, but I'm calling you with a joke. And we hear throughout the episode, she does this regularly. This is her new persona. She's now going to make up a joke uh, to 
tell to uh, Dr. Manhattan, um, who is her former partner. You know, he talk, she talks about that. She talks about the fact that Dr. Manhattan was uh, was the first person that really got superpowers. She gives you a background history about all four of these main characters from the comic book, effectively. And she even gives more detail about who she was from the comic books. She is able to get the things done that she wants to get done because nobody would suspect her. Nobody nobody sees her coming, basically. It's a little bit of that uh, idea of hiding in plain sight, you know? Um, she is the kid that threw the brick up in the air in the first messed up joke that she told and ends off being that character at the end of the corrected joke. You know, I love how she yeah. did that. that she tells part of a story that doesn't make sense and then talks about all the heroes who are sent off to hell. And then it turns out that actually that first part of the joke was all about her, just a normal average everyday daughter of a bricklayer who taught her the way to live her life. And now she's living her life that way. It's really, really brilliantly done. Uh, one of the great touch, uh, as you may have noticed, uh, guys, was as she starts the joke, it cuts to her in a taxi and there's a sign on top of the taxi for American Hero Story with the comedian on the sign with the tagline, comedy begets tragedy, which is what this whole episode is about as well. You know, this joke begetting the tragedy of her life, really. So uh, really, really cool. Yeah, I, I must say, I thought, uh, I thought the, the whole conversation with Dr. Manhattan interspersed throughout this episode, mm -hmm. uh, was again, just a really nice structure to, to, to the episode and the different jokes. Um, that, I mean, let's be, let's be honest. It wasn't that funny because as you say, it ultimately is a tragedy, uh, what's happening yeah. here. Um, and I, I love the sort of the, um, the atom of, telephone box you mm -hmm. know I, I think you know you've got the the red telephone box in the uk you've got the doctor who telephone box for the police uh -huh. and now we've got the uh call mars telephone box with the the atom uh symbol of dr manhattan but we do see kind of on the screen in in the telephone box the true kind of industries uh, and we get to hear that Lady True, an industrialist, has bought uh, Vite Industries as well. And so she is running this show. So again, a little bit of a, a mystery around um, this Lady True who has um, taken over Vite's uh, holdings uh, as he is presumed dead or, or somewhere missing in action. I thought it was really good. Mm -hmm. I loved it. So again, the... the the amazing thing is how much they've sprinkled in the history mm -hmm. yeah, for definitely. you to, fig to to figure out as they go along. So even with the phone call and the the, the other thing about um, Vice is that in the comic books, Warshak's journal last entry in the journal is before they go to the Antarctica. So and no one fully knows the history of what transpired out there. Yeah. So all they know is that. Warshak's dead, Warshak never returns, and Veidt never returns, and Manhattan leaves the Earth. And they also know from the journal that um, Rorschach was blaming everything on Veidt. He sent the journal off before they went off and before he went off to his death. So they everybody knows that Adrian Veidt was responsible for it, according to Rorschach. Um, and then, as we mentioned on the feedback episode for episode one, there is this idea that people that believe in what Rorschach said are now crazies, effectively. They're... they're have been pushed away from society as people that believe in, in crazy talk effectively. So uh, that's where the original origin of the seventh cavalry came from is that they believed in what Rorschach was selling um, and nobody else does. So they, that's why they're such a marginalized group effectively. So everybody else seems to believe that Adrian Veidt was doing good things for the world kind of thing. So, um, so it's interesting how they've twisted history a bit. Exactly. And we learned that even in the briefing when we're getting a briefing on the Seventh Cavalry mm -hmm. um to Agent Blake. Um it's just very interesting to see the dismissal uh of the New Frontier documents and Rorschach and everything that happened. Yeah. So it's just what I'm really loving about this episode in particular is how I think it's a mix of the structure mm -hmm. of how they actually tell the story as a whole, but also what they're dropping in, the hints and the 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 background that they're dropping in, which for any of our uh, watchers who have listened to previous kind of reviews we've done, I, I'm not a huge fan of Basil Exposition <laughs> when it comes to TV shows, where they just kind of, usually what this means is where two characters, uh, think of James Bond. This is where the, the villain of James Bond will give a monologue about why he's <laughs> done it and how the background and how he did it all to James Bond. It's a very 
exposition heavy for no reason, mm-hmm. just so that the audience can catch up. The one thing I'll say about this is they're not doing that. They're they're dropping these crumbs. Uh, if you know now, if you've already read the comic books or watched the film, you'll yeah. understand parts of it. Yeah. If you don't, um, and you are not aware, then it will probably make sense later on. Absolutely. And the book is massively to do with exposition. There's so much stuff that's in there that needs to be told to people so they understand where this character is coming from. One final touch that they do that I absolutely love is when she finishes her monologue or her joke on the phone. She ends it with Rorschach's famous phrase of, good joke, curtains close, everybody laughs. Uh, it's a lovely little touch to one of the other major characters from the comic, the fifth member of that of that team, effectively. So um, the maligned member, I suppose. Um, John, do you want to take us on with your major point at Five Minutes to Midnight? Yeah, my major point is my two favourite women, actually, uh, Angela Aber and Laurie Blake. Mm-hmm. Uh, Regina King, Jean Smart, I absolutely loved the back and forth between these two in, uh, in this episode. Uh, the cutting nature of Agent Blake against the... Um, equally cutting nature of, uh, police officer Abar and mm-hmm. just how that comes to a head. I mean, I, I just that whole thing of Agent Blake being sent to Tulsa to investigate the death of Judd Crawford there. And I mean, again, the, the, the notion that she says a, a police officer wearing a mask or just another name for a vigilante. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, that maybe speaks to something uh, that you said uh, in one of the earlier episodes, Derek, are these actually police officers? Yeah. You know, there is this question mark. But I think for me, the coming uh, to a head really between these two characters were Agent Blake says, how about that coffee now after the explosion uh, and, and an attempted uh, sort of terrorist attack by the Seventh Cavalry? Mm-hmm. And you get this big question now about Angela Abar, about her being an unreliable uh, narrator, you know, and I, I think um, Laurie Blake here really gets to the heart of the matter. She kind of cuts through uh, that, that, that fudge, really, um, this idea of the death by lynching, but no autopsy done after she has had that uh, conversation with Looking Glass. So um, good, yeah. I, and, and then the fact that with the seventh cavalry member at, at the cemetery, um, the first thing is to put him into the empty grave, but to put the coffin on top of him. Mm-hmm. Okay, to, you know, maybe suppress the explosion. But also, I suspect that uh, Judd Crawford is now widely scattered uh, amongst the cemetery so. uh, to prevent this autopsy, which was never done because, well, that lynching... Um, was self-evident. That's how he died. But did he now? That is yeah. the question. And the body being destroyed. But also this idea that the Seventh Cavalry is an easy uh, suspect here in terms of this organization. It may be too easy, that suspicion hanging over them. Uh, because, you know, you, you have the lynching, which is obviously that reference to, uh, the KKK. And, and, and she says the Seventh Cavalry is just the clan with different masks. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and then, this 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 whole um arrival of this guy with a suicide vest and a uh, chest bomb on uh, at the funeral and wake uh, a memorial to Judd Crawford but she she has a great uh, line where it's like well how were they so quick to dig that tunnel or was it just a lot of extremist gophers um <laughs> to do that again is this really um and I suspect so that the seventh cavalry has been implicated in this, but maybe it isn't them at all. Um, that mm-hmm. there is, that there is some ulterior motive coming here and a huge part of suspicion now over Angela Abar. Um, and of course the best thing for me, um, is where she talks about the secret compartment in Crawford's house. So you Absolutely. just have the sort of mannequin doll or, or sort of a uh, bust where we had seen the sort of the grand master outfit for the KKK um, and just her sort of call back to my father had a secret compartment and, you know, and I always check because of that. And sometimes it pans out and if it does, it's really good. So she's seen Mm -hmm. this secret compartment. um, And again, there is hints here that this police force may be, um, a band of vigilantes. So for me, this was just like awesome. Yeah. I, I, I loved the 
just the suspicion of these two ladies sort of uh, really um, butting off one another. Really. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I really, really enjoyed this conversation. It really felt like the detective coming at 10 and going, well, this is what I've learned in the last few days, and you may not have noticed it, but... I'm here directly after this guy died and he's already going to funeral. That seems odd. You know, this is the chief of police of the town. He's already going to funeral and you didn't even tell me that when I was coming into town. Nobody even mentioned it to her. She started saying that to, to looking glass. And then she's suddenly at the funeral and she goes, hang on a second. If nobody knew about it, how could possibly somebody be drilling a hole and get underneath the ground from outside of the, the cemetery and yeah. get here and, and set up this whole thing? You know, um, I also did love that moment where she shoots the guy in the, in the head killing him going, well, you know, every suicide bomber says it's attached to their heart, but most people don't do the, <laughs> don't do the attachment. <laughs> I was quite surprised that this guy did, you know, really, uh, really interesting, but it is fascinating seeing the two of them together. Really looking forward to seeing more of Angela and, uh, Laurie side by side. They're, they're proper strong women, uh, attacking each other really good. Yeah. yeah I, th- I think as well, just when Angela leaves that sort of cenotaph that, that, sh- um, Agent Blake has kind of confronted her in and you, that you just have that shot of Agent Blake, uh, framed by the red circle of the kind of, uh, whatever night vision goggles that, uh, mm-hmm. Angela Abar has been using down in the tunnel. So uh, yeah. like really, uh, some really nice stuff here. Absolutely. Like you mentioned, Chris, those are the, like the night owl goggles that Laurie would have seen quite a lot on her partner at the time, Dan Dryberg, you know, so she would have seen night owl's goggles quite a lot. So it's probably reminiscent of what she's seen before. And you're right. I love how Abar's head is just popping up as she walks into the, into the, uh, Zenitaph. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. as she walks in there and you see, Angela's head popping up over it with the with the glasses on, and then the scene ends with them uh, highlighting Laurie in the background. Very cool. Uh, anything on that before the ticking clock counts us down to four minutes to midnight, Chris? No, nothing from my side. I, I actually have quite a similar point. So let's shift it forward and then talk about my section, but we'll pull you and John in at the same time. The doomsday clock has been set to four minutes to midnight. So, yes, it is the ticking clock, and we are at four minutes to midnight. Chris, what is your medium point uh, from this episode of Watchmen? For me, it's previously what we just discussed, but it's very much just the the funeral as a whole. Um, and more how we see the, uh, the, the, the politician, how he comes out smelling of roses. To a degree. Mm. Mm. Senator Keane, isn't it? It is, Senator Keane. He is the reason that the cops are wearing masks Mm -hmm. after White Knight. Um, We find out quite a lot about him. And we find out he does have presidential aspirations. Mm -hmm. As he does inform um, Laurie that uh, maybe her friend could use his help. Yes. Um, So it's very interesting. uh, Mm -hmm. Based on just taking the fact of what we just discussed. That... Um, the body is destroyed and Judd Crawford's, uh, extracurricular costume is mm. missing. Yeah. Um, that the Seven Cavalry shouldn't know because it was a last minute thing. They shouldn't have been able to tunnel unless they had, um, indoctrinated, uh, gophers as part of the Seven Cavalry. <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah. but we're not quite sure. So it's just the, the whole, being of this funeral and how it goes boom in the way it goes boom mm-hmm. and then the fallout from it is just so interesting for me absolutely and i love this this description of Keane as well the senator Keane. um he's the son he's senator Keane jr the son of the person who brought in the original Keane act in the 70s in the comic books uh, which effectively outlawed vigilantes so what's interesting is this character is coming along with his presidential aspirations saying well actually what we can do with the Instead of having vigilantes, we can dress up the cops and then everybody's safe and the actual people that have got masks on are people that are protecting everybody. That's okay, isn't it? Yeah, is that okay? Not really. They're the same thing as vigilantes is is what uh, Laurie's saying here. You know, We were outlawed when we were trying to stand up for people and we were trying to be heroes. We were outlawed. Uh, And now you're bringing it back and putting it in the hands of the powerful people uh, who are in your pocket effectively. So, yeah, it's really, really interesting. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I think this is just, it's, it's that pivotal moment, isn't it? It's, it's, it's the fact that you have this wake, you know, funeral for, uh, the, the deceased police commissioner, um, I suppose for Tulsa mm-hmm. in, in Judd Crawford, but then you have it, you know, massively interrupted, uh, with the seventh cavalry uh, and, and seemingly it's again another attack by the seventh cavalry 
on the, the police officers. Mm-hmm. You know, we've had White Christmas, um, and now we have this attack. Because technically he could have gone um, and taken out all the officers there in Tulsa. It's interesting, you know, he does go for Senator Keene here because um, I thought, well, okay, what's the rationale behind this? And is it because of the, that he is looking to bring back vigilantes? Because I presume his district or his, you know, his state is Oklahoma here. Yes. So that uh, this is what he's brought in. He's saying other states want to bring it in as well. Mm-hmm. Um I think very much, again, it links into Agent Blake's dismantling of the current narrative by the Tulsa police force. Uh, and I wonder, we were talking about, is Keane um, maybe part of the 7th Cavalry? Um, certainly from when he was at the wake in the Crawford's house. Mm-hmm. Uh, or actually, is he now um, on... Um, that maybe the side of Angela Avar. However, he is the one that also asked for Agent Blake to go and head to Tulsa to investigate, um, the murder of Judd. Yeah. So, so far, I, for me, he's floating around, but I, I, this is a really, uh, interesting, uh, yeah, boom goes the funeral. <laughs> well, there is the third option, which I think is my, preferred option, which is that he's not working for the Seventh Cavalry. He's not leading them, but he is using them. He's using the idea of the Seventh Cavalry, who seem to be a pretty big vigilante organization who feel like they're being put upon and being accused of stuff. We saw that with the police stop in the first episode. This guy was like, why are you stopping me? There's no reason for you to stop me on a night like this. I'm just driving home kind of thing. Um, so maybe he's just using this everybody being scared of the Seventh Cavalry to get what he wants. Maybe he's using the attack even White Knight. Why is Angela Barr alive is a big question for this series. Why didn't they, when they had her dead to rights, why didn't they kill her? That still hasn't been explained. Was it because one of the people behind the mask was Judge Crawford? And what he wanted from that night was for the police to be able to be masked and to be able to be in the streets and be able to go about their business and do whatever they wanted to do. And this is what Keane is delivering for them all. Yeah. He definitely had a close relationship with Senator Keene beforehand, we heard his wife worked for Senator Keene. So potentially he's just using the seventh cavalry to get what he wants to get his political aspirations, um, to the, the main office, I suppose, in the White House. You know, maybe that's what he's trying to do and that's what he's trying to use. Um, so many things that are pointing to that. So I'm intrigued to see how it plays out and intrigued to see what the actual history of, of this is. You know, we do have that moment when Larry comes into town to find the police officers. I thought she'd be going to the police station. Yeah. But they can't because everybody's masked and they're hidden. So actually they're working out of an underground lair, effectively rounding up all of the seven cavalry, beating them into submission and beating confessions out of them effectively. Um, well, that's what Angela did to get the location of the farm back in episode two. He, here we see they're using the racist detector, the interrogation machine, to get all the information out of these seven cavalry members. And the first person we see coming out has told them nothing. So are they just being put upon effectively because of what Senator Keene is doing? You know, if they do believe, for example, in the Rosh Hash journal, which we as viewers and we as readers of the comic books know is absolutely accurate and absolutely true. Well, are they just being targeted by this segment of society and being used to further an agenda? So... Uh, definitely a massively political use of this of this group as well. Yeah, and what what got me? I, I, I don't think Angela did it on purpose, but I just I was screaming in my head why the <laughs> pushing of Judd's coffin on top of the uh, explosive because he was already down the hole. The suicide bomber was down the hole. He was mm-hmm. dead. It would have just funneled up. But why did she push the body essentially on top of it? Yeah. Um, I, 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 but, but, yeah, I, I mean, can see, I can see both going, going, oh, well, it's trying to cover the explosion down. So mm-hmm. it didn't go as far. Um, but a part of me as well was like, yeah, you're sh- getting rid of the, the body, Judd's body. Yeah. Because you, you hear from Agent Blake that, um, they were going to dig him up the next day. Yep. So uh, presumably they knew about it. You know, it kind of goes to the first point. This, idea that there is a different um story behind all of this yes. and there's a lot of people implicated and uh yeah i mean yeah. i don't i don't trust anything that's coming out at the moment i really no. don't uh, i love i love that i know? absolutely love it and i do think it is also possible that angela has just been used and that's just her instinct yeah. is to limit the damage remember her kids are there you know she wants to limit the damage as much as possible she doesn't want any members of her team or her family 
injured by this. So that's possibly a very good reason why you drop a massive heavy coffin on top of this bomber to, to limit the damage in the area. And totally understandable. But maybe Keen just knew that. Maybe he just assumed either all these people are killed or potentially uh, the body's going to go one way or the other effectively. So, yeah. um, so potentially she's not actually involved. Um, potentially she just did her natural instincts and that is how it played out, which is what I believe is going on. Yeah, no, that's amazing. Anyway, so enough of the, the boom. Mm-hmm. Now let's talk about, uh, the boundary. Yes. Derek, do you want to give us your, um, point? Yeah, let's go on to the other major character, I suppose, in this episode, and, and one that we still don't know a massive amount about. Um, <laughs> we have Adrian Vice uh, announcing his name uh, at the end of the episode here. Still not sure if it's him, though. <laughs> um, I'm really intrigued by this. You know, we, we hear early on in the episode mention of Night L2, of, of Dan Dryberg being in prison. Um, Laura doesn't seem to bat an eyelid at this. She obviously knew that her former boyfriend was in prison. Uh, and this character seems to be in his own prison as well. We see in the titles of the show, he's constantly just called the man of the manor. Um, he's testing the boundaries of this prison that he's in. Uh, the gamekeeper is appearing, telling him he's crossed the boundaries. That's something he said he wouldn't do when he arrived into this area, into this manor where he lives. Uh, he's got servants who are there to help him accomplish what he wants to do, um, which seems to include trying to create uh, the ability to fly off into space. He yeah, the proto-space kind of suit. Proto-space suit, exactly, to get out of this place that he's in, possibly Mars. Yeah, although, quite frankly, uh, the idea that metal would be a good insulator in the vacuum and cold of space, uh, I am not surprised that Mr. Phillips was uh, a Phillipsical um, <laughs> or something like that. And even when he goes... We need a thicker material. Mm-hmm. Um, and I presume that's why he goes off to hunt the bison to yeah. get a kind of a thicker leather. But yeah, that's not going to keep them warm. No, not no. in space. I presume uh, he's trying to use everything at his disposal to get there. I'm not too sure whether it's, it's buffalo, isn't it? It's, it's, uh, I think it was it buffalo. Like, yeah. Or bi- bison. Or bison maybe. Yeah, um, like but yeah, I don't know. I don't know whether creating leather out of that would have, uh, would have gotten a better spacesuit, but it is fascinating what he's doing. You know, Adrian Veidt was supposed to be the most intelligent man on the planet. That's why everything played out the way it did in the comic book. So you're wondering why this version of Adrian Veidt is trying to do things, but isn't able to accomplish them. Um, he's smart, but just seems to not understand something. Something has been either removed from his brain. Some knowledge that he used to have seems to have been removed. He's playing into the position that he's in, but doesn't seem to understand it. I think most interestingly, and why that sticks in my head, is because he gets the letter from the gamekeeper telling him really politely that he shouldn't have crossed those boundaries, and he writes a letter back to him, which is very polite as well, <laughs> um, and in-universe as to what he would be doing. But if he knew that he'd been potentially taken out of a prison on Earth and put on a prison on Mars by Dr. Manhattan to keep him away from the rest of the world, the three million humans that he that he killed, according to the joke from, uh, from Larry, um, if that's what's happened to him, he doesn't seem to know it for definite. He knows he's in some form of um, captivity of some sort, but doesn't know why and has some something wrong there. And it's not just that physical or maybe um, existential captivity that he's in, but he has technological captivity mm-hmm. because there is no technology or th- there's no electronic technology. You know, it's the typewriter. There's no phone. Yes. He's using bow and arrows, yet the gamekeeper does have that next technological leap with the firearm. Mm-hmm. Um, he's riding on horses. So he is also um, limited in, in what technology is ha- he has. Absolutely. You know, you see the play. It's all ropes, pulleys, sandbags, and, and you know, literally physical effects with the, the crisping of Mr. Phillips. So he actually has gone from fire to ice. Yeah, Mr. Oh, Phillips. <laughs> and um, He'll be so in Game of Thrones next year. Again, because he was such a, you know, his, his company was a technology he was an industrialist mm-hmm. he was a scientist and it's to reduce that avenue from him so that's true. even with that limited technology yeah. he's trying to find his way out yeah. um, and yeah. i remember even in the first episode he couldn't cut the cake because he had no knife he had a horseshoe that was the only thing close <laughs> enough to metal that would allow him to cut this cake which he destroys again in this episode so he's also living a bit of a groundhog day as well he's coming back to the house every day and they're they're there waiting for him with a cake t- to signify his anniversary which is seemingly 24 hours since he was 
doing the exact same thing over and over again. But he's advancing. You know, it's like I'm trying to remember that Doctor Who episode, uh, Peter Capaldi's Doctor Who, where he has to live the same day over again. And he eventually breaks through Diamond because he's cracking the wall over and over again for a thousand years. Is that or for a million years, I think. Um, is that what's happening with Adrian Veidt here? He comes back every day with the same, with the knowledge of what he attempted yesterday, and he starts building on on his um, experiments each day to eventually get himself out of where he is. You know, yes, yeah, it may be the long game approach to mm-hmm. his escape for yeah, sure. Yeah, fascinating stuff. That's the best way of putting it. Mm-hmm. Fascinating stuff. I'm just, I, I don't want to keep making guesses because. Ninety-nine percent of them will be wrong, which I usually love. <laughs> yeah. But uh, and I should say, I usually love doing that. It's just <laughs> they're giving enough each time that is making it interesting. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah. It really Without a doubt, is. like th- this is li- peak Lindelof right here. This episode is absolutely that moment where you're going, "Yep, I have no idea what's going on. It's fun. I'm going to speculate the hell out of this, but I could be." vastly off what he's yeah. expecting people to think is happening <laughs> and i could be vastly off what actually is happening as well so uh, yeah really intrigued by this one john your point also includes adrian vice yes and i mean it is the fact that you know we seem to get definitive closure that the man in the manor or i'm calling him the man in the high imaginary castle nice is adrian um vite um we have him here as as the as jeremy irons suits up in uh Ozymandias' outfit. Yes, absolutely. Uh, which is really, really good. But again, for me, I'm just like, oh, is he? Mm-hmm. There's something, um, I, I just love the way it's written. I, I love the way it's captured and, and the, the story is being told because I still can't fully believe anything in this show. <laughs> uh, I, I, I think I am definitely, you know, 90% certain that it's Adrian Veidt given, uh, that he is, the, with the Ozymandias outfit. But Maybe he just had it, nothing else to wear, you know? But his, it, all the rest of his clothes were in the wash. It, it, well, it could, <laughs> it could be, but it, it's just the fact that just before that, we have, um, the man in the manor cross-legged in that contemplative Dr. Manhattan pose, that mm. floating, um, pose like the Buddha, um, just beforehand. And mm-hmm. I'm going, so is that to suggest that again that there's just a bit of trickery going on here? Um, but I, I suppose I am leaning into the idea of the Asian Vite for the safety of, of Earth and mankind and womankind and every other kind, uh, is, um, being kept at arm's length from them by Dr. Manhattan. He, mm. he is protecting Earth from their greatest threat, which is Adrian Veidt. Yeah. Maybe not just arm's length. How long is it between Earth and Mars? A couple of million kilometers? <laughs> uh, easy, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so he's being kept at a couple of million kilometers length uh, from Earth. I definitely think he's on, he's on the planet. I think we mentioned on our feedback episode that you see Dr. Manhattan standing over a manor, uh, which is collapsing. Because I got it wrong in the first episode, I thought it was his last palace on on Mars that had collapsed. It looks much more like the manor, so we believe that this is what's happening, which makes you wonder if he's seeing a collapse in front of him on a on a news story that's broadcasting from the planet. Is all of this stuff happening before the stuff that's happening currently on Earth? Potentially, because that was a news story that we saw in episode one. Um, has Ozymandias already escaped, and this stuff happened a few years ago? Potentially, that's another another way to see it. But again, as you say, John, you can't trust anything in this show. This is all messing with you until episode nine of the season, I think. <laughs> well, absolutely. I mean, it, it's even uh, the game warden uh, mm-hmm. who who fires at his feet. You know, is that supposed to be this this mental depiction of Doctor Manhattan Maybe. keeping him in his kind of zone in in his prison? Yeah. Um, yeah, I feel like so Dr. Manhattan like would create himself a lovely mustache and a, uh, and a flat cap, wouldn't yeah. he? <laughs> He'd be a game warden. And thanks very much for the tomatoes. The ones who grow on trees, they're, uh, they're pretty awesome. <laughs> well, so exactly. So, I mean, it is slightly weird, this, this place that Adrian Veidt is, but is it because that's the parameters that Dr. Manhattan has created, or mm. is it that Adrian Veidt has been fusing different crops together to create tomatoes on trees oh, yeah just to prove they're properly fruits you know exactly because <laughs> they are exactly chris anything else on your advice i think that's kind of the the main points of our middle section that's really it again similar to you guys i straight away thought it was mars as soon as that we see 
poor Mr. Phillips coming back in a frozen popsicle state. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I was just like, oh, so there he is. Um, I, the, the question is, how long does it take for images from Mars to get back to Earth? Mm. That's the bit. So if the telephone story is only taking something like something 43 minutes. 40, se- 40, 40 seconds, isn't it? 40 yeah. seconds. Yeah. That may not be true. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so we may be seeing something different. Yeah. Um, but there's nothing to say that that, that was manner one. Mm-hmm. They could have been manner three, four, five. Yeah. Um, I wonder who else is there. Yeah. Yeah. So we- you, you could Rorschach be there. Hmm. Could the, the prison of Dan Driver be there? Uh, probably not. But well, com- let's let's say comic book because we don't mind spoiling the comic book for this show, right? Because this is taking place afterwards, so you should know, or at least not mind being spoiled on the comic book, I suppose, at Definitely. this stage. So, uh, Doctor Manhattan clicked his fingers and Rorschach disintegrated in front of him yes. in the comic books. But absolutely, because we don't really know what disintegration means for uh, Doctor Manhattan. Maybe he clicked his fingers and Rorschach was put into a prison off planet, uh, just like. Um, we're kind of think we're seeing here with Adrian Veidt. So yeah, don't really know, but that would be, I think, a massive thing for Damon Lindelof to do, having people think for 30 years that this character was disintegrated, but actually he's living up on uh, another planet. That would be a massive moment. <laughs> because if you can imagine the gamekeeper mm-hmm. being Rorschach. Maybe. Um, Possibly. And because he's of... A lot more polite in his letters than he was in his diary, though, isn't he? <laughs> but they're all they're living the same day. They're being yeah. controlled. They're being manipulated for the last 30 years. Mm-hmm. So what better way to keep an eye on potentially your worst enemies or the people who you thought were friends? Mm-hmm. Uh, and you don't yeah. want to, you don't want to kill them. You don't want to send them to jail. You, so you create your own version of jail for them. I like it. I like it. Especially, yeah. you know, the underlining in the joke. From Laurie, uh, the underlining of the fact that what Dr. Manhattan's end point was, was he gave up on any thought of the universe. He gave up on any thought of any living being. He basically said, well, it's the same number of atoms in a dead body as there is in a live body. So what does it matter if the state, you know, so yeah, yeah. this idea that maybe she's wrong, maybe he does actually care for the planet that she lives on because of her, which is what she wanted to happen at the end of the book. So the other thing is, is the gamekeeper did look a little bit like the Lone Ranger who was, Taken from Bass Reeves. So again, it, you know, the, there's that thread going on here as well, mm. which is kind of interesting. That character from the silent movie in the first. Exactly. Episode, from the yeah. first episode. And yeah. um, it was that, that old Zorro with the kind of mustache. Yeah. Um, but again, that, that similar idea because Zorro being, um, partly, uh, inspiration for Batman and that idea of the mask as well mm-hmm. on, on both of these. So yeah, really kind of interesting. Yeah. I think. I think we could talk about this episode for another hour, but let's get on, because the clock is ticking. Let's get on to our three minutes to midnight. The Doomsday Clock has been set to three minutes to midnight. This is fab. We've never been able to play the sound effects of all of our three minutes to midnight while John and Chris are able to listen at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> are you enjoying it, John? Yeah, it's just lovely hearing my voice <laughs> in that way. It does make you kind of sit, sit up a bit more straight. Oh, and... yes, it is. Pretend that you're being held high by a, a piece of thread. <laughs> Brilliant. Good posture and enunciation. Enunciation. <laughs> Chris, speaking of which, do you want to enunciate and tell us your final <laughs> moment? Your small minute that you want, would like to talk about. Well, actually, my small minute is quite a large minute, um, <laughs> or member, sorry. Um, uh, the adult entertainment has taken on um, Dr. Manhattan, mm. or his likeness, I should say. Uh, possibly, yeah. 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 One person that would know, and she's yeah, in that exactly. room. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm talking about the um, adult entertainment, uh, the toy that uh, Miss Blake brings out in the hotel with her. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's an interesting. I was not expecting that. No. Um. No. So the whole thing is like we see the suitcase throughout. Yeah. The, the 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 we see a suitcase from her. She's carrying around. It we do see a glow. I was like, oh maybe it's a bit of a yellow or blue glow. Maybe mm-hmm. she's updated her silk specter outfit and she carries her costume with her. Yeah. And she's always that one moment away from putting her costume back on right or right. a mask back on that's where I, I thought it was going yeah i kind of had that moment of like pulp fiction you know that you know where you see the glow from the from the yeah. box throughout the movie and you never find out what's in the box i'm kind of wondering whether i wanted to know what was in the box by the end of the episode well the thing <laughs> is as well is that literally the only thing that she's carrying in in that metal case because 
she does have it opened up, and I thought I saw some kind of console, and in her apartment, there's music coming out of it, and I was like, is this kind of like... Or there was music playing, but yes. it was whilst she had the case open. So I just thought there was an Alexa kind of within her <laughs> case that had been done. And because then she closed it and the music stopped. But yeah. maybe, I don't know, I, I thought there was something more than adult entertainment uh, in the case. There's just the reference anyway, uh, material, I suppose, about um, Dr. Manhattan and... Uh, Silk Spectre getting together, coupling effectively is, is what the, the thing that's inside is. So it looks like this may be a mass market, uh, adult item that's on sale and she yes. bought one. And I'm wondering whether yeah. she's always wanted to try it out and never, and decided not to many times, something like that, because you see her sitting there and she puts it together and then she knocks on the door of Agent Petey and I don't think she takes it with her. It's not explicit. I presume she doesn't take it with her. Uh, I think she's looking for the real thing instead of depending on uh, on the not real thing. Yeah, but if it's glowing, does that mean it's kind of alive? No, I would say that's probably just to so add to a little bit more authenticity to this adult item that's on sale to the general public. So did Agent PC and her get it on? Or yes. Or yes. did she get it on? And do something to Agent PC? Like, was it kind of slightly weird and perverse? I don't think we'll ever know. What I think happens is she looks at the box, goes, maybe tonight is the night I'm going to use it, or maybe I'll knock on the door of Agent PT and uh, give him the opportunity to sleep with a star, basically. And he put on his mask. Yeah, that was quite cute. He did. He did. It was cute. Was really it was just like he put on his sleeping mask with the eyes going out. Yeah, yeah. I, I was expecting a little teddy bear as well next to him, <laughs> with kind of like in an Aussie Mandias outfit or something. Mm-hmm. It was just, for me, it, it was just quite funny. I, it was just, I was not, it was not what I expected. No. Nope. It was nothing like that. And it was just, okay. I, I, as it, as it was shown, I just went, all right. Th- okay. Yeah, sure. I mean, yeah. Why, why not? There is the, you know, the, in the comics, there is the, the four Dr. Manhattans. Mm. Uh, with Silk Spectre. She yep. did have balls as well, didn't she? Like atom balls. She attached the extra piece to the more phallic member. Yeah, yeah. So she, a, a rocket ship, basically. basically yes. Yes. Yeah, yes, yeah, yes, a blue rocket. Yeah, it's kind of yeah. kind of attached by magnet, is what it looked like. Um, yeah. Okay, yeah. So int- yeah, interesting idea uh, there. And you know, clearly, this is the love of her life. Doctor Manhattan, she was in love with him completely yes. until actually the moment that you just described there, John, where four Doctor Manhattans are pleasuring her. While he's working on a project downstairs, which doesn't go down very well. They actually used that as inspiration for Iron Man. Um, when uh, they have Iron Man using his, in one of the movies, they have Iron Man talking to Pepper through his uh, Iron Man suit, but he's not inside it. He's downstairs working on a project. So that was just yeah. something that they took from Watchmen so, as well. Yeah, so Watchmen is like the Simpsons of of, uh, of the comics. Watchmen did it. Watchmen did it, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. Exactly. But that was the moment when she realized there's something very different about the guy, but she was in love with him. She was truly... That this was the greatest man in the uh, on the entire planet, not just because he was the only superpowered person in the world, but he was the person that she was in love with until he left the planet and went off to Mars. So, um, so kind of showing that a little bit about that she still has never gotten over, yeah, gotten over him, but willing to go with Agent Petey, which is, uh, you know, mm, we used to kind of have that "don't shit in your own doorstep" kind of rule about work, you know, <laughs> never a good idea to, uh, to end off with a work colleague, especially on this kind of field trip, uh, a young well, colleague like this. It was either Agent PT or a, a big blue rocket. <laughs> maybe, yeah, maybe those are the choices. <laughs> so, yeah. That's your choice. Balls. You're, you're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna do the real thing at all times. Uh huh. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, but anyway, that's enough of the adult entertainment in the Watchmen industry. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Let's let let's hope the merchandise. Let's hope the merchandise from uh, this show doesn't extend to adult entertainment. Oh, why not? Why not? Ah, Sil- sure. they can Silver see what they Rocket want. is replaced by a Blue Rocket. Give the people what they want. It's the first <laughs> rule of commerce, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go on to uh, my next moment. Uh, one of the things that we haven't really talked about too much, but I loved that bank heist at the beginning of the episode. This is all about Laurie. This whole episode is all about her. Um, I kind of knew who the character was, uh, to be honest, coming into the show. I'd seen uh, Jean Smart being interviewed about playing the character of Laurie, so I wasn't a big surprise that she ended off the episode being the Laurie that we knew from the comic books, being Silk Spectre and her uh, older version of herself 30 years later. Um, what mm-hmm. did surprise me was our intro to her as her walking into a bank, 
<laughs> and taking out a weapon and trying to hold up the bank. I was going, yeah. hang on a second. She's changed a lot since the comic books. And then we have this universe's version of Batman turning up. Um, who turns out to be Mr. Shadow is, uh, is the name. You know, I love that kind of mashing up of Batman and also, uh, the Shadow, which was one of the other original comic book characters from DC as well. I love that little touch there. He looked so like Batman. And I love the idea because, you know, you think about, the Batman movie, Dark Knight, um, where you have Batman trying to stop a bank heist going on. Yeah. This is absolutely something he would do is trying to stop a bank heist. And he's taken outside and basically shot, um, for trying to stop a bank heist. And you see the, you see the crowd who are watching on going, what are you doing, FBI? You know, this is a guy who's just trying to save people. But effectively what she's saying is, yes, he may be trying to save a bank heist, but it was a total setup by us and he didn't know it. So. These guys walking into situations that they don't actually know all about, well, maybe they're not the right people to be stopping crimes because maybe they're not crimes at all, you know? So that's, that's been her whole belief. And that's how she entraps all of these people is by creating a situation that they don't do their due diligence on, I guess. You know, I would assume that Batman, for example, wouldn't actually walk into a trap like that because he would investigate it completely beforehand. He'd have all his, all of his knowledge in the FBI knowing that there's somebody trying to set him up. But this guy sticking on a mask and walking into the situation didn't, and now he's got a. Uh, he possibly won't be able to walk again. He's uh, he's off at the hospital with a couple of bullets in his back. Yeah, know? it was a good twist. It was a good twist. Mm-hmm. I also liked the 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 moment after where uh, when Senator Keen comes to her door and he mm-hmm. goes, uh, "Nice work uh, catching the re- the Revenger." Yes, and she goes, "It's just Revenger. There's no the." Uh-huh. And this was the shadow. <laughs> it was just real put down. The, um, the Revenger was last month. Yeah, yeah. and the Revenger was last month. Oh, mm-hmm. sorry, Revenger, Derek. Yes. There's no the Revenger. And um, yes. Revenger was last <laughs> month. So I really like that kind of little uh, tic tac between those two characters. Mm-hmm. Um, and as well, we see the owl here as well in the cage in her apartment. What's his name? Who? The owl, John. The owl is cool too. <laughs> Love it. A little bit, a little bit of who's on first. Uh, always, <laughs> always a good joke. <laughs> uh, that, that's my, my moment. I really wanted to talk about that, that part of the episode because it's a great start of that character and, and throughout the episode, so many cool moments with her. Weirdly, I was able to pick out the shadow. You don't, you can only see his, uh, his jaw line. You don't see him without the mask on, but I can pick out the actor who was playing him. It's played by, uh, Lee Turgeson. Uh, you may recognize him as one of the main characters from Oz. Uh, and also he was in, um, Generation Kill, um, which was made by the same guys who made The Wire. Um, really, really recognizable face underneath that mask. And I think that's the only time we're ever going to see him in the show, but he's a really well-known actor. So kind of cool to see him in there. Yeah. John, do you want to take us on with our, with your final, uh, note for this? Three minutes to midnight? Yes. Um, my final, uh, point really is the, the Black Freighter, uh, references here, the mm-hmm. tales of the Black Freighter references. Um, Tons. you know, we have the flag, the, um, as, uh, the Lord of the Manor saddles past it, uh, held up on, on, a, on a scythe. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've got the, the sealed letter that came from the game keeper uh the game warden to adrian vite uh, in his castle mm-hmm. uh where the the seal has the skull and crossbones on it yep. as well and agent blake and agent pt are hauled up in the black freighter in yes um as well so there's a few uh references here um and, and you know you're just trying to think does this mean anything because mm-hmm. of the the comic within the comic of the tales of the black Fraser yep. uh, and that sort of lone survivor after being attacked by vicious pirates, uh, to collect their souls to, to come back and warn everyone. Yeah. So, you know, is there an element here that, yeah, is, is Adrian Vite trying to warn people coming back from this, this journey where he's been imprisoned or is it something to do with um agent pt uh, and agent blake yeah. um so I, I i don't know i don't know whether there's going to be those kind of connections but it it's just nice to see these references coming through but exactly as you say you know seeing the man in, in the manor going past a flag and seeing the stamp on a letter yeah fine that's all happening in this possibly created world where the man in the manor lives but yes they're staying in the hotel called the black freighter Inn in the real world what we know is the real world here so it's blending between the two, and it's the only thing that's now connected the two universes in the first three episodes of the show. Both universes have been completely separate up until this moment in the episode, and they're such tiny, possibly just Easter eggs, that yeah, someone on the exactly. writing team went, stick a Black Freighter sign up there, you know? And someone else on the other writing team who's writing the stuff that's happening off and uh, off with the man in the manor went, oh, stick a Black Freighter flag there. 
I'm sure the overall Damien, Damien Lindelof is going, those two things are connected somehow. But what is the connection? It's yeah. great. And I mean, a, a seal is an identification. Yeah. So it, it is, uh, that's really important because it is that this game warden is identifying himself as something to do with the Black Freighter. Yeah. Possible pirates yeah. is the collector of souls, you know. And um, so th- th- that's kind of interesting. Absolutely. And just remember, we also got introduced to a character name that we haven't had so far. One of the uh, one of the police officers is introduced as Pirate Jenny. So that is also another reference to the Black Freighter. Pirate, does she go higher? She's introduced, she introduced herself as Pirate Jenny. She's got her mask A, a on, bit of rum reference. and me coffee in the morning. <laughs> exactly. But she is kind of well known um, in the circles of comic book fandom because there is a connection there to the writer of the Black Freighter or the, the source material that ended off in the creation of the Black Freighter. So it's an interesting one, way too in-depth to go into on our podcast here, especially in our final minute before midnight. But it's really cool that we're starting to get the names of these characters coming out because since we can't watch them with subtitles on, it's very difficult for us to see the names of the characters until the episodes come out. So uh, so always good, right? Yeah, good stuff. So anything else with the clock set to three minutes? The Doomsday Clock is now at two minutes. I repeat, two minutes to midnight. So, guys, any points or Easter eggs uh, that you noticed in this episode? There's not much that we haven't covered. Um, so there obviously is the Buccaneer flag that we've talked about. Um, Night Owl, we get mentioned that Night Owl is in prison. I think for me it was certainly Agent PC um, is the author of PCpedia, mm-hmm. which is the special... Uh, website, uh, connected to, uh, loads of different articles, um, that we talked about on our feedback episode for yep. episode one. And um, so definitely, uh, check that out if you haven't already. And um, there's lots of things like the, the Rorschach journal memo, uh, the stuff about Adrian Veidt's death. Is, is he really dead? Uh, and a whole host of other things, including, uh, base Reeves as well as the, um, the inspiration for the Lone Ranger mm-hmm. and the work that he did uh, rounding up criminals uh, in, in the US. So uh, I thought that was really good. And I, you know, for me, a- Agent PC, to begin with, I thought there was something a little uh, kind of suspicious about him. Mm. I-, I thought um, he's also quite, you know, clean cut. So I was just, I don't know. And he has this history of the Watchmen, you know, he's, he's introducing that into no, the be. FBI analysis. And, and the guy who heads the task force is kind of like, you know, shut up Agent PC and just work the slide projector. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, you know, he, he's talking about the Rorschach journal. He, he's having that conversation with Agent Blake on the, uh, the flight to Tulsa, uh, as well. And, and we also get this glimpse of this millennium clock as well that is, is there as well. So, um, yeah, that was the main thing for me. I've already mentioned about Lady True. So. It just kind of led me into uh, one of the ones that I noticed in there about Lady True. Um, it, she's seen here as being the person that took over Vice Industries. So she's now the person of power, really, the person with all the money in this universe. She's the one that's created all these phone boxes throughout uh, throughout society and this millennium clock. Um, and they say that she used that big quote, my name is o- Ozymandias, King of Kings, look on my works, ye mighty, and despair, uh, which is from the, the original sonnet that gives Ozymandias his name. Um, so I do love that she effectively took over Vice organization and then stole his identity <laughs> effectively and said, I'm now Ozymandias. Um, I'm now the, the one that sh- you should look on everything that I do and despair at the fact that you can't accomplish these types of things. So uh, really, really good little touch there from Lady True. Um, I also like the fact that Lady True does sound like a superhero name in this universe. It really does sound like Lady Justice or Lady True, you know, that really, really cool. And just to mention two things at the funeral that I forgot to say when you were talking about your point on the funeral, Chris, um, still maintaining that Western side of things with Judd as well. The song that, and I think it's hilarious, the song that Angela is, uh, is made start to talk and then sing is a song by Gene Autry called The Last Roundup. Um, I think also covered by Johnny Cash as well. I don't know which one's the more popular version of it. Johnny Cash has become massively more popular than Gene Autry over the years, but you kind of guess that you know, someone like Judd would be a fan of old school country and Western music. So I love that you've got Angela up there trying to sing a country and Western song. It just doesn't fit her personality <laughs> at all. Um, one last one that I noticed in there, the graveyard itself is called the Tartarus Acres. Uh, Tartarus is from Greek myth. Um, Tartarus is the place 
is effectively hell. It's a place where people are sent to be punished and particularly Titans. So it ties in so well with that joke that Larry's been telling throughout the episode where each of the heroes comes up and tells their story as in, and is sent to hell. And the main character that we had die in the first episode, the person that was murdered in the first episode, Judd, is in a cemetery called hell, effectively. So uh, a nice, nice little touch in there. Good stuff. Good stuff. But there's loads, so please. Yeah, absolutely. Wonderful watchers. Send in your uh, emails to us for a feedback episode that'll be coming out later this week. Uh, your cutoff point for feedback is on Wednesdays at uh, two minutes to midday GMT. Uh, email us at feedback at tvpodcastindustries.com or I have got a spoiler post up on our Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash TV podcast industries where you can talk about all of your thoughts about this episode. One final thing that we completely forgot to mention while we were talking about the episode, even though we said before we talked, went into our discussion that we were going to talk about it. Um, that final moment of the episode, uh, just after what we believe, I suppose, is Will's truck is dropped in front of Laurie, right? Um, that is, that seems to be the flying car has now returned uh, yep. to Earth, right? Um, right in front of Laurie. Uh, there's that moment in the sky, uh, up above where we all saw what looked like a hand-drawn star, um, possibly a little bit red and yellow in color, um, indicating that probably the CGI work was going to go ahead in the future. But I think all three of us, we talked about this separately before the podcast, I think all three of us have the same idea of what we think it's supposed to represent. There's two options, right? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. So do you want me to say them? Go for it. One yes. option potentially is that that's going to be replaced with a reflection of Mars in the sky. Uh, an actual image of Mars in the sky to to have an indication that Larry's looking up after a phone call for Dr. Manhattan and he's answering her in some way by dropping this car in front of her. So she believes that potentially Dr. Manhattan is listening to her phone call. And the other one is, well, she was going out with Night Owl for many, many years and spent a lot of time around Archie, his vehicle, and potentially she's looked up in the sky and saw sees the bottom of Archie, a, a ship that she would see all sides of over the many years she spent with uh, with um, Dan Dryberg. So one of those two things has happened. If you've watched the episode on HBO, you've seen one of those two things or wrong. And it's just a star that looks a bit hand drawn. Maybe. <laughs> I, I think it was just slowly out of focus. That's my thing. So I'm hoping it was it was actually as is because I was just like, oh, that's Mars. And it's just panning focus. Okay. On it. Um, but we'll see. Yeah. yeah. Um, it, that leads a hundred more other questions though. So is the man, will the man in the wheelchair actually friends with Dr. Manhattan and living on Mars? Was it actually Dr. Manhattan that stole him? Yeah. Or is he friends with Dan Dryberg and Dan Dryberg is not in prison. He's running out in the yeah. open as Night Owl. He's doing Hel- stuff. Yeah, yeah. Helping out Will to expose what's going on in the, in the society here in Tulsa, Oklahoma. So yeah. loads and loads of interesting questions about it. Yeah. Good stuff. So guys, what did you think of Watchmen episode three? She was killed by space junk. Mm-hmm. Chris, take it away. I'm in love with this show. Uh, mm-hmm. I, it, it, it's ramping up. I know I say that quite a lot with a lot of the sh- <laughs> shows we, we discuss. Yeah. Um, the show is r- very much reminding me of the, the same feelings I had with Lost in the very mm-hmm. first season where you're consistently asking questions and getting very small answers, but then as it's asking you an, another hundred at the same time. Yeah. Um, and it's just that you want to binge. Um, and I think very much so that this is not a show that should be binged. This should be savored. It mm-hmm. should very much be, we're going to watch one episode. You're going to digest it. You're going to think about it for a week. Then yeah. you're going to get some of those revelations and the, the answers to it. Um, so I, I, I'm really, really enjoying it. The acting's great. The storyline's great. The mm-hmm. sound is great. I don't have a negative thing to say as of right now uh, mm-hmm. about it. Um, so yeah, that is where I am on this as of episode three. So, Derek, what do you think of this episode? I think best episode so far, uh, without a doubt. This is really, really good. You know, I said earlier on in this episode that I watched all of Leftovers this year, and there was a point in each season of Leftovers where you go, yeah, it's okay, yeah, it's okay. Oh, my God, this show is amazing. <laughs> and each of the three seasons of Leftovers had that moment for me. Lost had it in episode one. Lost had its pilot episode, and I went, this is a show I will watch every episode to the end, and I absolutely loved it all. I loved that show uh, to bits. This show had its starting point, set up the characters, set up the universe, and did exactly what the comic book did in its first five pages. It created a murder that needs to be solved. Now we're on episode three, and now I'm seeing the potential of this TV show. I'm really seeing what they're doing with it and how much this universe 
is going to be interesting. You know, I'm really looking forward Definitely. to keeping going with the rest of these nine episodes because everything in it, all, every corner of it is just filled with stuff. I want to pause every time I'm watching it to go, what's that newspaper headline say? What book is that guy reading? You know, <laughs> everything that's going on feels like it has, it matters and has weight to it. So, uh, and then you have someone like Larry walking into every scene and just disrupting all the things you thought, you know, from the first two episodes, you know, as John mentioned, We've effectively gone, hi, Angela, thanks for telling us your story for the last couple of episodes, but hey, maybe that's all wrong. Maybe she actually is working for a, a government organization uh, trying to get the new president to take over from Robert Redford, you know? Uh, I love this. It's so interesting. So loving this episode, my favorite so far in the season. John, do you want to give us your final word on episode three of Watchmen? She was killed by space junk. Yeah, I mean, for me, uh, just like you, this is... Uh best episode so far um i give it five extremist gophers out of five nice. um you know effectively a simple tale of an fbi agent um coming to investigate the death of a prominent police officer or commissioner of the tulsa city police department uh, and it ends up with an awful lot of intrigue here um and yeah the the blowing open of this whole narrative that angela uh, abar uh, and and the previous two episodes has constructed around judd crawford's death in um in tulsa i think these two actors are phenomenal and i love them um kind of playing off of one another uh, i really like the introduction of agent pc um, and then you have the reveal of Adrian Veidt in the manor uh, and the Ozymandias costume. Mm -hmm. You have a lot more connection coming in with Dr. Manhattan through the joke, the bricklayer joke in the Mars transmitter or, or telephone box. Um, and so this was just really so layered, mm -hmm. so nice. Um, and again, yeah, with the, the Black Fraser references, you know, what significance do they have? So uh, this for me was um, absolutely uh, an amazing episode. Uh, and so, yeah, five extremist gophers out of five. <laughs> I kind of imagine a gopher now with its little nori teeth with kind of a belt of grenades, <laughs> Rambo-y kind of Fantastic. going on. Wearing so, Rorschach mask as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. One more we missed throughout the episode because I need to Google the episode names uh, once again. Uh, she was killed by Space Junk is a song by Devo called Space Junk. Um, interestingly, the final line of the uh, of the song is um, it smashed my baby's head, Space Junk, and now my Sally's dead, Space Junk. Sally Jupiter, of course, being the mother of our lovely Laurie at Blake uh, in this episode as well. So lovely connections here space junk obviously we've got dr manhattan off in uh, off on mars so uh yeah possibly he dropped some space junk this car and it almost killed the daughter of sally jupiter yeah and that was the name of the band that she asks um her to play music for when she enters her apartment for the first time diva bit of diva yes yeah. and just because i have to bring it back to base level does Space Junk refer to her uh, adult <laughs> entertainment? <laughs> or her boyfriend who likes to walk around naked. Yeah, absolutely. Her ex-boyfriend yeah. who likes to walk around naked. Yep. So maybe she was almost killed by <laughs> Space Junk. <laughs> Possibly. Well, that's about it for uh, our discussion here of episode three. She was killed by Space Junk of the Watchmen series. Uh, remember, everyone, fellow watchers, that you can send your feedback for our Bulletin of our Atomic Watchers feedback special podcast as well. So this will be five minutes to midday. I keep getting that wrong. I keep wanting to say midnight. Uh, five, no, it's, it's two minutes. So I'm getting it doubly wrong. It is two minutes to midday on the Wednesday after uh, our full episode discussion has uh, been released. Mm -hmm. So please yeah, get in your thoughts and feedback for this episode three of the Watchmen series. You can send anything through to feedback at tvpodcastindustries.com for email. Join us on our Facebook group at facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash TV podcast industries. And of course you can send in audio feedback uh, by going to our website and leaving up to 90 seconds of your dulcet tones uh, for us to play back on our feedback episodes. So mm -hmm. please, it will be great to hear from you. Yeah. 
Yeah, I'm really liking the idea of having you guys send your feedback into us after we've talked about the episode so we can hear some stuff that we got wrong and also talk about the things that we completely forgot to talk about on the episode discussion as well. So thanks so much for everybody that sent in all of our feedback. And also make sure you join us for our Watchmen pub quiz. Uh, we have one question a week for the first eight weeks of our feedback. And in the ninth episode, the final episode of our Watchmen coverage, we'll uh, pull a name out of a hat of any of the people that have gotten all eight questions right, and they'll win a Watchman-related prize, which Chris will be choosing in the next few weeks. Yes, and more importantly, we just want to hear John say, two fat ladies, 88, like in bingo. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, remember, for the pub quiz, just have a pint of beer as you listen to our feedback episode. It will get you in the mood for, okay. for, for the pub questions that I, I bring. And on that, I do have to think about what... Question I will ask for episode three. Mm, yes, intriguing. You'll find that out on our feedback episode uh, next week. Um, to support the podcast, we'd love if you'd share the podcast with your friends and with anybody that's following you on social media. If you've been enjoying it, share it out there. It always gets us more listeners when uh, when our listeners share it out with other people. So thanks very much for showing the love to everybody that has shared our podcast in the past. You can also support us by going over to TV Podcast Industries on Patreon patreon.com slash TV Podcast Industries and throw a couple of bucks our way. It uh, helps to pay for the storage for our podcast and helps to pay for us to do all this uh, stuff that we do on our podcast. So thanks so much for joining us for this episode. We'll talk to you again next time. Yes, we'll be back for Watchmen episode four. If you don't like my story, write your own. <laughs> Chris, do you want to read the synopsis for this uh, next episode? Sure. Reclusive trillionaire Lady True finally enters the stage with a mysterious offer. With Blake getting closer to the truth of her cover-up and journalists looking glass for help, the Lord trains two new servants. Ooh, interesting. Mm. With Blake getting closer to the truth of her cover-up. Ooh, so Angela is being implicated in this cover-up as well. So, mm, fascinating. Really looking forward to that episode. Bye-bye, watchers. Keep watching the watching. Yes, please stop watching and start listening to The Watchmen. Yes, thank you so much, fellow watchers, for joining us. Uh, I'm off to go and train a few extremist gophers in the art of sumo wrestling. Uh, but we'll be back soon for more on Watchmen. Bye. Bye. Bye.